Well, I've titled this one, The Greatest Invitation. And uh, this is an invitation that has gone out to mankind ever since the great events around Jesus' life. In John 2 verse 19, Jesus says, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now the temple, of course, was a type. And it served nearly as a type for everything that Jesus stood for. And uh, in a sense, we too can become part of a spiritual temple which God is preparing. And he says, he who overcomes, I will make a pillar in my house, in my temple. So there's a spiritual temple that is being prepared. But here Jesus is talking about a temple, saying this temple... And in three days, I will raise it up. Well, the temple was quite magnificent. Here's a, a replica of it that was built in miniature. And you'll find this one in Jerusalem. And the Jews answered him in John 2.20. Then the Jews said, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So Jesus was predicting that he would die and that in three days he would rise from the dead. Now the Jews used inclusive reckoning. So if he died before sunset on the Friday, that was day one. The Sabbath, he rested in the grave. And the first day of the week, he rose and any portion of a day was considered a day. So that was three days. And uh, he spoke of his resurrection. Now if you go to Jerusalem, you will find this garden tomb where some claim Jesus lay, and it looks highly probable that this is the right place. And there's a groove here. And uh, in this groove there must have been a giant stone, a giant flat stone that could be rolled away. And that's sort of what it looked like. It's an interesting place. They discovered this while doing some excavations. And when they came across this, they were stunned because everything fits so beautifully into place. Verse 22 says in John 2, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. John 2, 22. Now what scripture were they referring to? Obviously the only scripture that there was was the Old Testament. And so it referred to the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. There's a beautiful story of the Messiah and how he would suffer and how he would die and how he would be crucified amongst criminals. And uh, they must have referred to those scriptures. John 2, verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, 17, and 18 take this resurrection and tells us what the significance is. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain. All the other great religions of the world serve at the tombs of their founders. But not Christianity. The tomb of Christ is empty. And so it says, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith also is in vain. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. Because only through the death and the resurrection of Christ can my sins be forgiven. And this is something that the world must understand because there is this movement today to join up all religions as if they were on the level with each other. But if you remove this sentence, then salvation becomes meaningless. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So in other words, those that died in Christ are waiting for the resurrection, which is guaranteed through the death and the resurrection of Christ. He was the first fruits of that resurrection. 
How could he be the first fruits if the Bible says that others were raised by Christ himself? And the book of Jude implies that Moses was raised. Well, the fact of the matter is there are people in heaven that never died like Elijah or like Enoch. And uh, what about them if Christ is the first fruits? There was the wave offering and Christ the first fruits rose together with the graves that were opened and a number of people were raised from the dead at the resurrection of Christ. What about all them? Christ is the guarantor. In other words, even if people were translated before the death of Christ, it was under the foreknowledge that Christ would die and be raised from the dead and overcome sin. So they, their salvation depends just as much on the death and resurrection of Christ as ours does. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you see the foreknowledge? God knew that he would succeed. Could he have failed? Yes, yes he could have. He was fully human and he was fully divine, but he never used his divinity once to protect himself. Not once. And so in his human form, in his humanity, he could have failed, but he succeeded where Adam failed. So this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death. So only in Christ is there salvation. Because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Can we be witnesses today of the resurrection of Christ? Yes or no? Yes, yes we can. Yes, we can. Because only in Christ do you find the type of transformation that we see in people who have accepted him and follow him in all his ways. Without him, it is impossible. So Christ must be alive. And if you walk with him, and you will have an experience with him, then you will know that he's not rotting in some grave, but that he is the one who rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father. And then, after the resurrection, Jesus gives the commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, the full Trinity, the full power of the Godhead, teaching them to observe, what does it say? all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even unto the end of the world and this commission is all encompassing you cannot leave out a portion here and a portion there you must teach everything so a relationship here that culminates in baptism is based on truth it is based on the word because what Christ taught them either through the prophets or personally is the word of God and uh, we cannot take portions of it we have to take all of it observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you did Christ speak through the prophets in the past yes or no absolutely all things were created by him and for him and nothing was created that was not created by him so everything from the beginning comes from Christ baptism is mentioned 80 times in the New Testament would you think that that was important then I would think so it's not just a fleeting thing 80 times it is mentioned John 3.23 says, and John also was baptizing, speaking about John the Baptist in Enoch, near to Salim, that's another form for Jerusalem, because there was much water 
there. So for baptism, do you need a little bit of water or do you need a fair amount of water? You need a fair amount of water, John 3, 23. So what does it mean to baptize? The Greek word is baptizo, which means to dip, to immerse, to plunge under water. And there must be a specific meaning to this as well, because God does not do anything haphazardly. Everything that God does and says has a meaning, has a deep spiritual meaning. God is not a God of the just so. So to baptize means to put under water, and this is the Jordan River, and this is where John the Baptist baptized, because there was much water there. Matthew 3, 5, and 6 says, Then went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region about the Jordan were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now what is sin? We've learned about that. What was that? Transgression of the law. So people who did not live in harmony with God came here, confessed their sins, and the baptism was a symbol of the washing away of sin. And they came and they reasoned, and John the Baptist spoke wishy-washy words or plain and cutting words? Plain and cutting words. And then eventually Jesus himself came to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And he said to Jesus, I will not baptize you. You must baptize me. I'm not worthy to, to loosen or tie your shoelaces. And Jesus said, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Now we have a question here. If baptism is a symbol of the washing away of sins, one of the symbols, was it necessary for Jesus to be baptized? Did he have any sin? No. He says, the devil is coming and he has how much on me? Nothing. Nothing. Not one sin. Jesus was the sinless, spotless Son of God. Why was it necessary then to fulfill all righteousness that Jesus also submitted himself to the rite of baptism? Because Jesus is not only our Savior, He's not only our God, He's also our example. And so Jesus sets an example, and it is said in the Bible that if you follow Christ, you should walk just as He walked. So studying the life of Christ is studying the Christian walk, and Christ was baptized. And Jesus, when he was baptized, Matthew 3, 16, he went up out of the water. What does that tell us, how he was baptized? He, was under water. he must have been under the water. That's what it says. So Jesus was under the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. So the Spirit of God descended not as a dove, but like a dove. Now how does a dove, dove descend? Gently, gently. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. That's the NIV, or this is my beloved Son, King James Version. With him I am well pleased, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Whenever someone is baptized, that same privilege is his or hers. When you are immersed, then the same thing happens. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And God says, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. Please. So the dove 
does not necessarily literally mean a dove, but the attributes of a dove are what we will find in the function of the Holy Spirit. That is something that uh, is worthy of studying. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Now the word power there implies the means, the mechanisms, the tools, if you like, to put it bluntly and simply, to do everything that he was going to do. Because he being fully human, yet fully divine, was not going to use his divinity to his own advantage. And in all things he was tempted such as we were, so he tapped into the same power that we can tap into. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Acts 10, verse 38. So in the power of the Holy Spirit, he went out doing good and preaching the gospel of salvation in him for the next three and a half years. Now the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. So John the Baptist wasn't the only one who was baptizing, and in fact it says Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, but the disciples baptized people after John. Now the question here arises again, why did Jesus not baptize? Because he's the one that is typified in the baptism. He set as an example, but his disciples who were the ones that baptized thereafter. John 4, 1 and 2. Now something else that's interesting about baptism and the type of questions that arise around baptism, because today it is believed that all you have to do is just say, here I am, I'm ready, you baptize yourself, and basically Christ paid it all, and we can live as before. But Jesus placed people under grace and then referred them back to obedience. Do you remember that? We've mentioned it before. The classical case was Mary Magdalene. Neither do I condemn you being placed under grace. Go and sin no more being placed again under the law. Now, in this particular instance, there was this uh, high official. He was the treasurer of uh, a queen, he was a eunuch, he was a black man probably, and he was traveling through the desert, he had been to Jerusalem, so he was a Jew, he was a devout Jew, and he was reading the Bible, the Torah, when Philip was sent to him. Acts 8, 26 to 28, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. That's also, if God speaks, do it. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasures. So he was the minister of finance. That's what he was. But he was a Jew. Because... He had come to Jerusalem for to worship. It was the Passover, and so he came to worship on that particular day. Was he therefore acquainted with the rights and laws and judgments of the Jewish system, yes or no? Yes. And he was a devout Jew. He had come to worship. So he knew everything about the Old Testament. Do you think he knew the Ten Commandments? Absolutely, he knew the Ten Commandments and he came to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and he was reading Isaiah the prophets. Acts 8, 26 to 28. And so Philip comes up to him, sits, is invited up onto the chariot and he talks to him and he says to him, what are you reading? And he says, I'm reading Isaiah the prophet. And uh, he says to him, do you know what you are reading? 
and he reads a passage of scripture and he talks about the lamb that was taken before its shearers and who opened not his mouth and was led to the slaughter. And Philip asked him, do you know what this is about? And interestingly, the eunuch says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? That's fascinating. God operates like this. He works through people and he informs people of truth via his people. And here was a devout Jew. He was studying the book and he was seeking to find an answer and Philip was there to supply it. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me. Different translations say should explain it to me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture where he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. And so Philip explained it to him. What was the one thing this Jew lacked? He had the law, he had the Torah, he knew what it was to be obedient and to keep God's precepts, but what didn't he know? He didn't know who the Messiah was. And so Jesus was introduced to him by Philip. And when he realized that, when he realized that this sheep was the one that was being slaughtered, that it was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, that is when he said to Philip, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he ordered the chariot to stop. He knew the law. He knew the Torah. And now he found the treasure of heaven. He found Jesus Christ, Amen. the Savior. And so he says, why should I, shouldn't I be baptized? Now this whole section in the book of Acts is written in a chiastic structure, which means answer or question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Now if you have an NIV Bible, or if you have any of the modern translations of the Bible, you will be hard pressed to find this verse. Because your Bible will have verse 36 and verse 38, but it'll leave out verse 37. Check it tonight if you want to. Acts 8, verse 37. And Philip said, the question was, what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Very important answer. So what was the prerequisite to baptism. Believe, in your heart. believe with all thine heart. Why do you think some modern translations prefer to leave that verse out? <laughs> and also say at the bottom that it was not in the original text, but the chiasm, which is a question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, would be destroyed if you left that text out. And so that text, as it stands in the King James Version and in some good translations, should be there. Amen. And it says, If thou believe with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now remember, he was a Jew. Jesus said, teaching them what? Do you remember it? All things whatsoever I have commanded you. All things. If you love me, keep my commandments. Today, we have people who do not know anything about the requirements of God and they accept Jesus as their Savior and think they can walk on as before without coming into harmony with the precepts of God. So the Jews had the law and they didn't have the Messiah. Today we want the Messiah and we don't want the law. It's rather confusing. In actual fact, 
those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Amen. That is what the Bible says is the group that stands for the whole gospel. Because why did Jesus die for us? Because we were in transgression. Does that mean we stay in transgression? Of course not. So it's very important. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. This is what he lacked. He didn't know the Messiah. And when he accepted the Messiah as his personal Savior, he was baptized. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Acts 8, 36 to 38. So in all the examples that we have, we see that the Bible talks about a baptism and that it is a baptism of immersion. Now if we go to the early church, you will see that the early church also baptized by immersion. Here is a Byzantine cross and an old Byzantine church. And uh, this one is in ruins, of course. And if you walk through these ruins, there is an ancient baptismal font where they baptized these people. There's a close-up. You can see it over there. You went down the steps and uh, that's where they baptized. So the early church, after Christ, baptized by immersion. This one over here is an interesting one. This is also a Byzantine church. This was built there where the Essenes used to live. And uh, these early churches all had baptismal fonts with steps leading down. This is in the desert where there isn't much water, so they had a smaller font. But baptism by immersion is certainly possible in a font like this. If you go to the ancient churches, they also reveal the method that was used in previous times. This is the first century church in Philippi. This was the baptismal font where people were baptized. And uh, if you ask yourself, where does the baptism, by sprinkling or by infusion, pouring the water over the forehead of an infant, comes from? Well, then you have to go to Rome to find out because this is where it stems from. And even if you go to some of the older churches in Rome, you still find large baptismal fonts. And uh, here in Cappadocia in Turkey, the hidden city of some Christians in the Middle Ages, there you also find baptism by immersion, and they had these deep baptismal fonts where you went down the stairs and were baptized by immersion. Some of the reliefs and some of the paintings that we have of that early period, if we go to Russia for example, here's the baptism of the Russian king Vladimir the Great, a painting of that by the early uh, Byzantine church, today the Orthodox Church is a remnant of that, also baptism by immersion. And here's an early relief of uh, Christ being baptized by, in an African fresco, and there you have also him standing under the water, and he's, the water coming up to his waist. So where does this infant baptism then come from? If the Bible speaks about baptism by immersion, and if the Bible says, if you believe with your whole heart, then you may. Can an infant believe with his whole heart? Can an infant make a decision, yes or no? Who makes the decision for the infant? The parents make the decision for the infant. And the infant that cannot make up its mind yet, that doesn't have the capacity to understand, is covered by the parents. The New Testament says, Paul says, that if you have a marriage, and just one of the individuals, is in Christ, then the husband is sanctified by the faith of the wife, or the wife is sanctified by the father, or else, what does it say? Your children would be unclean. 
Fascinating text. In other words, when we look at infants and small children, the responsibility for their nurturing and for their growth and for their final capacity to make a decision by themselves rests with the parents. And Jesus did what to little children? He blessed them. He said, suffer not the little children to come unto me, and he blessed them. And he for reprimanded his uh, disciples when they tried to keep the infants away from them. But this infant baptism is not biblical. It comes from an ancient rite. It comes from Babylon. Because infants were dedicated via this system in the past. They even took infants some rites and immersed the whole infant, but uh, most of them actually just infused or sprinkled. In the 6th century AD, we have the introduction of infant baptism. Now the god Janus, who was the two-headed one, the one that looks forward and backwards, we have the same in the two-headed eagle, that's where it comes from, was twice born. Holy water was used for baptism and it was made by taking a torch from the altar and plunging it into water, which then became holy water. And uh, today, it is the same sort of thing. They take a candle, in some rites, from the altar, plunge it into the water, and it symbolizes the sun god plunging into the waters of the womb to be reborn as Horus, the savior. So that's where this ritual comes from and where holy water comes from. The following curse was pronounced on Roman Catholic Church defectors. May the Son, who suffered for us, curse him. May the Holy Spirit, who suffered for us in baptism, curse him. Let him be accursed who says adults must be baptized. This is History of Romanism, page 510. So Rome introduced infant baptism to come into harmony with the ancient pagan rites. Now, by the way, you can see where this actually comes from. Because in the pagan rite, the Holy Spirit and Horus are all one entity. You know the dove was the symbol of the female aspect of the deity. So, if you look at Luciferian worship, then Lucifer is both male, female, you know, and the dove, and he is also regarded as the Holy Spirit. That we read in Alice A. Bailey's books. And what is interesting here is that it says, because they are all one, may the Holy Spirit who suffered for us in baptism, curse him. Did the Holy Spirit suffer in baptism in the Bible? Yes or no? No. The Holy Spirit descended gently like a dove on Jesus. Who was the one who was going to suffer and die? Jesus was going to suffer and die. And certainly the baptism that took place does not reflect this baptism, but reflects the plunging and the death of the sun god, but not of Jesus Christ. So, the curse by Roman Catholicism that you are cursed if you stand for adult baptism tells us where it comes from. Cardinal James Gibbon, the faith of our fathers, answers this question or answered that question for several centuries after the establishment of Christianity. Baptism was conferred by immersion. So yet the Rome admits it, that total immersion was the way in which baptism took place. But since the 12th century, the practice of baptizing by infusion, that's pouring the water over the forehead, has prevailed in the Catholic Church, as this manner is attended with less inconvenience than baptism by immersion. Does that make much sense? No. That doesn't make much sense at all. John 3 verse 3 says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So this born again represents 
a dying and a resurrection. And baptism stands for that death and that resurrection. One that we experience in Christ. It was not until the Council of Ravenna in 1311 AD that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. So the pagan rites were brought in gently, 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 and today they are there, they are entrenched, and if you don't follow them, then you are accursed. So, like with all the strange doctrines that we have in the Christian world today, we have to go to Rome to find them. The system where church and state works together to bring about one Unitarian form of religion, which will be the ultimate worship of the angel with the torch, the fallen one, Lucifer. Well, Rome is very impressive, very spectacular. This is the statue of Moses that was made by Michelangelo. And it has a little notch in the knee, and uh, they tell us that Michelangelo looked at the statue and said it was perfect. And then he threw his chisel at it and said, get up! But of course it didn't get up, it just got a kink in the, in the knee. That's the story, whether it's true or whether it's not. The great Pontifex Maximus, the great bridge builder to take the place of Jesus Christ, the one who is the bridge between heaven and earth is certainly not the Pontifex Maximus, but is Jesus Christ. So with all these systems, we find that Rome is the one that is behind it. And it's the one that's receiving the accolades and the worship today. It is claimed that infant baptism brings the infant into the family of God. And... Uh, then they claim that this is the new covenant which covers the whole family. Baptism is as a consequence of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, learning all the precepts of Christ, accepting them, realizing that we are sinners living in transgression to God's law, and that our only hope is to have this blood washed away in the blood of the Lamb, and then walking in harmony with Christ, in His power, through Him. That's what it's all about. And infants just cannot do that. Here's a little infant font that you will find in the Vatican. There is no room for any immersion in that. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 5, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. How many baptisms do we have out there in the world? Many. Many, many different rites of baptism. Some baptize by immersion. The Baptists, for example, baptize by immersion. Others practice infant baptism by sprinkling. Others practice infant baptism by infusion. Others practice no baptism at all with water, but claim just a spiritual baptism. Some practice baptism in immer by immersion by dunking once. Some practice ba baptism by immersion by dunking three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And some practice baptism by immersion seven times. Which one of those is right? The Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Surely it should be quite simple to resolve the issue. You have to go to the reference source, isn't that right? And what is the reference source? The Bible. Then why don't people take the standard of the Bible, follow the dictates of the Bible, and then we should have one baptism, isn't that right? How many times does it say, did Jesus go under the water? Once. Does it say anywhere that the eunuch went under a couple of times, yes or no? No. So it should be possible to have one right. In fact, 
any doctrine in the Bible should be discerned by following the same method. If A says this way is the way, and that one says no, this one, and this one says no, that one, and the churches are splitting all the time on these issues, surely we should be able to go to the Word of God and say, well, that's what the Word says, let's do it that way. And if you can find a church that says, this is what the Word says, let's do it in every single aspect, well, then you would have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But unfortunately, we don't live in a world like that. So let's have a look at the symbolism of baptism so we can see what it really entails. 1 Peter 3 verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not by the removal of dirt from the body, but by the pledge of a good conscience towards God, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. So when you are baptized, what are you remembering? The resurrection of Christ. Now the Christian world out there says, we remember the resurrection of Christ by doing what? By keeping what? By keeping Sunday. That's not biblical. That's not biblical. You remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ by participating in baptism. And you know what? The Bible tells us something interesting. It says you are baptized, you rise, and you are baptized in Christ. Did Jesus also institute a mini-baptism? To remind us of this event. Yes. He introduced foot washing. And he said, As often as you do this, then do this in memory of me. Do what I tell you. You will be blessed if you do this. The foot washing is a mini baptism reminding us of the washing of rebirth that we had. In a sense, you are going through life and uh, picking up a little bit of dust here and a little bit of dust there. And in the solemn rite of communion, when you participate in the body and the blood of Christ, then the foot washing forms part of that. And the Bible clearly says that we should do this. Blessed are you if you do this. And very few do that either. I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3 verse 5. Will the man on the cross, the thief, be in heaven one day? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Was he baptized? No. no. Then how can this text be true? You see, if you do not have an opportunity to do it, God will judge the intent of the heart. If you know and you do it not, says the Bible, then it be for you sin. The time of ignorance God winks at. You must take all these things into account. I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water, if you have the ability and you know you must be born of water, and the Spirit. Without the Spirit, it is meaningless. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is serious. John 3, verse 5. So if we read on what happened in that early church when those conversions started taking place, they were struck by the words of the disciples after they'd crucified Christ. And they said, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent. What does that mean? Turn around. You were going this way, and go the other way. You were in sin and transgression, turn the other way. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2, 37 and 38. In other words, the issue at stake was 
that Jesus was the Messiah, the one whom they crucified. They broke the law by crucifying Christ because it says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. And they did it. So they had to repent, they had to accept Jesus Christ as their personal saviour, and they had to be baptised. Acts 2 verse 38 and 39, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now some claim this text to say it's fine to baptize little children. It's not what it says. It says that when you accept Christ, then you will be blessed, according to the Old Testament, for thousands of generations. God takes heed of your decision. And you give God the right to intercede in your life and to stand in the hedge and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when you are baptized, you are endowed with a special gift. Before that, you are prompted by the Holy Spirit. You can be led by the Holy Spirit, but now at your baptism, you receive a gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and your children, because your children are covered by your decision and your faith. And for all who are far off, all people, and for all whom the Lord will call. So it goes into all time. 1 Samuel 15, 22 says to obey is better than sacrifice. So if God says this, and if God says that we should repent and be baptized, then that is the right thing to do. Ephesians 4, 11, 13 says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So what are these gifts for that God is going to impart during baptism? For the ministry. For the ministry. It is for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Everybody receives a part. And even the most humble person receives a part. Even those that have virtually no real magnificent abilities can be so blessed by God that they become powers and giants within the church. Some have the capacity to pray, some have different gifts, some have gifts of hospitality for that matter. Who's more important? The one who makes someone feel at home and comfortable and comforts people, or the one who speaks the gospel? Who's more important? The one is not more important than the other. Can the one say to the other, I have no need of thee? Barnabas was known for his gentle spirit and for making people feel comfortable. And that is just as important as any great gift or to be an uh, evangelist or a pastor or a teacher. Whatever the gift is, God gives to each according as he wills for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come into unity of the faith. Now this tells us again, now what we see out there in the world cannot be right. You cannot have a thousand faiths or two thousand or more. There's one faith, one God, one faith, one baptism, until we all come into this harmony. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. Now the body of Christ is the church, the members of the body. Now can we be part and parcel of different bodies that teach different things, yes or no? Well, what do you say? If there's one truth, one baptism, one faith, can we have different faiths and different teachings on issues that are purely not biblical when we check them in the Bible, yes or no? No. 
Surely we must come into harmony when it comes to the things of faith. So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members of one another. So it talks about unity in the Spirit. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Romans 6, 4 to 6. So God, during baptism, when you become part of the body of Christ, you get endowed with the Spirit and empowered to do whatever it is God chose you to do within the body. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost. Now listen carefully. Acts 5 verse 32. Whom God has given to them that, what's it say there? Obey him. So does everybody receive this gift of the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? No. You have to be obedient to the precepts of Christ. Otherwise, this text, cannot apply. You have to be obedient to the precepts of Christ. So in other words, the eunuch was obedient to the precepts of the scriptures, but he knew not who the Messiah was. Today, if we accept Christ as our personal Savior, we also have to learn how to obey him, yes or no? You have to have both. And this is a very important issue. This will be a deciding factor at the end of time. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Does that imply dying? Yes or no? <coughs> yes, it implies dying. And therefore when you go under the water, you stop breathing. And that symbolizes the death. But if it remains purely a symbol, well, then it's no real baptism at all. If I die the death of the old man and I rise the same old man, is that a genuine baptism? No. no. So if I'm not taught the precepts of Christ, if I'm not taught how to come back into harmony with Christ, then that death and resurrection is really quite meaningless. I have to know how to come into harmony with Christ. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Now do you know that the Muslim world accuses Christianity of being a crutch religion? Because all you have to do is go on your knees and say, well Lord forgive me, and then you get up and you can do it again. And you can go to, uh, let's say if you're Roman Catholic, you can go to the priest and you can confess the sin and it's gone. And then you can do it again and go back and confess it, do it again, go back and confess it, and you always have recourse to this confession. And then if you are uh, in sin when you die, you get the last anointing, even when you're dead and all that stuff is cleared away. That's not Christianity, that's paganism. And it's not true. Muslims say, that if you commit something wrong, you pay the price right there. So if you're a thief, no more hand. You lose it. If you're a thief twice, well then it's hard to steal. You don't have any hands left in some of these countries. So you pay for what you have done. And therefore, that is true payment for transgression. Christianity is a crux religion, they say. And false Christianity is because people misuse the grace of Christ as an excuse to carry on a lifestyle that they had before. Isn't that right? But true Christianity requires the death penalty to such an extent that you die and are buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a, what does it say there? New life. New life. I cannot live the old life. Romans 6, 3 and 4. I have to be transformed. So when I 
receive the knowledge of the Son of God who died for me, and I am taught all things whatsoever he has commanded, and I accept that I am in transgression to God's law, and I accept the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, and I am baptized, buried with Christ in baptism. So when Jesus died, potentially all mankind died with him. And when he rose, potentially all mankind rose with him. But God honors our freedom of choice. And when we choose to follow him, we enact that ritual of dying in Christ and rising in Christ, and we receive a new life. Reborn. And unless we receive this new life, we are not saved. We have to come into harmony with Christ. And Christ kept his Father's commandments, yes or no? So must we keep them? Yes. yes. So obedience is a prerequisite. People don't want that today. They want cheap grace. They say, all I need to do is believe and I'm saved. Yes, you have to believe, but if there is no obedience, then you are a transgressor of God's law. And if you break one, you break them? Oh, and you will be judged by the law. And you won't have an intercessor. Jesus says to those that say, but Lord, Lord, did we not in that day do this and that and the other and cast out demons and do whatever it takes? Jesus says to them, depart from ye, me, ye that work, and then he uses the word anomia, which literally means against the law of God. Today in the world out there you have a doctrine which is called anomianism, which means doing away with the law of God. Anomia. You cannot have one without the other. You can't have salvation in Christ and then not come back into harmony with what he died for you, why he died for you, to save you. So, in order that we live this new life, we must be reborn. I'll tell you something. If you really become a Christian and you really follow Christ in all his ways and you are baptized and you rise in Christ and in him, through him, you walk the life of Christ, nobody will recognize you. Your old friends will say, who are you? I do not know you. I don't want to be with you anymore. Go away. I guarantee it. I lost all my old friends when I became baptized. When I started walking with the Lord and coming back into harmony with his precepts, all my friends were gone. I didn't want to drink with them anymore. I was a spoil sport in a sense because I didn't want to do the things I did before. And uh, my old, own family didn't recognize me anymore. So that is the type of new life that you must lead. But thank God, there are many, many friends that you make, and there's a new family. So death to our old sinful way of life, that's very important. Otherwise, it is not the real thing. The burial of our sins in the watery grave of baptism, and a resurrection to a new life in Christ, one that is in harmony with the precepts of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Totally new. Totally new. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Totally different. Can it cause turmoil in a home? If one accepts and the other one doesn't? The old husband doesn't recognize you. The, uh, the wife doesn't recognize the husband. Who are you? I don't know you. You're so different. You've totally changed what's happened. And many times they don't want to know you. 
And only prayer and patience and kindness can deal with an issue like that. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, transgression of the law, that's the definition, that's the only one in the Bible, might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. It's very clear. Romans 6 verse 6. So, Jesus paid it all. There's nothing I can do. Nobody can keep the law of God in any case. It's impossible. Is that biblical? Yes or no? Well, is it biblical or not? No, we must not serve sin. Can I do it in my own strength? No, only in Christ. But I can stop stealing. I can stop lying. I can stop cheating. I can stop looking where I shouldn't look. Because I have power over this neck, don't I? Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. If you want to be dead to sin, must you know what sin is? Yes. yes. By the law is the knowledge of sin, says the Bible. So if I want to be dead to sin, must I know the law, yes or no? Yes. yes. So you see, today we have a totally different problem to what the eunuch had. He knew the law, but he didn't know Christ. Today we know Christ, but we don't know the law. law. And so we have to come into the fullness of the stature of Christ. So dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we die with Christ in the rite of baptism, are raised a new person, spanking new, shining new, now new, if you have a new car, how many dents does that have when you buy it? In fact, if you get, take your brand new car into commission and you see a little eh, scratch there, what do you say to the salesman? Hey, what's that? After 20 years driving with a thing, who cares, you know, about that scratch? But you're very fussy about your new car, right? Well, that's what it's like. It's spanking new. How many faults may there be in that car? What happens if you drive down the road and you... What's the matter here, right? Isn't it supposed to be new? New means new. Totally new person. How many dents, how many sins, how many... Whatever is in that new individual? Not one. They're all gone. You stand before God as though you had... Never sinned. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I died, but I'm alive. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So if I boast and say, I have the power to do this now, and I have the power to do that now, that's not biblical either. In Christ. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2, verse 20. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. I don't become a puppet of Christ. Christ doesn't control me like a puppet and say, oh, you're a marionette, you have to do whatever this and that and the other. No, I have freedom of choice. And I choose to follow Christ. And every single day, the devil will say to me, why are you doing that? Are you crazy? Look what I have to offer you. But he's got a pile of potash. He's got nothing. And so I choose, day by day, to follow Christ. So baptism commemorates Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's what it does. Secondly, it symbolizes the death and the burial of the old man of sin. Thirdly, it represents the resurrection to newness of life in Christ Jesus. And fourthly, it indicates the washing away of sin. Acts 22, 16. That's what the rite of baptism stands for. That is the symbolism. When you are raised, what happened to Jesus? The dove descended. So, when you are raised a new person in Christ, 
then you receive the gift of the Spirit, whatever it is, as God wills. You know, many sit in the church wondering what their gift is. I don't have any gift. Nothing happened to me that I can remember. If you are not willing to walk with Christ, will you experience Him? Yes or no? no? Many exercise their gift all their years, all the years, and don't even know that they're exercising a gift. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, verse 16. This text is so misused today. Believes means everything. You've got to believe everything. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Acts 8, verse 37. Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent. That means come back into harmony with the precepts of Christ and be baptized, wash away, be reborn, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Because only in him do we move and have our being and do we live. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Does that mean there were some that did not gladly receive his word? Sure, many didn't. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Acts 2 verse 41. So to the body of Christ there was added 3,000 souls. Now today, this is a mass baptism in the Jordan. Many people go to the Jordan to be baptized. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands go to be baptized. And I wonder whether they understand the fullness of the rite of baptism. It's nice to be baptized by immersion, because that's a biblical way. And in fact, the Seventh-day Adventist Church accepts the baptism by immersion by other churches if it was done in this biblical way. And you can become a member by uh, proclaiming faith. Here's a young girl being baptized in a lake. And, uh, you know, they say, the Catholic Church said that it was less inconvenient to do it that way. Well, Christ said it, and I was stunned by this person. Uh, I took this picture in Germany where this young lady was baptized. What do you see there? Ice, Ice floating around. Wow! Wow! That's determination to be baptized, wouldn't you agree? That's determination. Let's have a look at the steps to salvation. And we'll look at them biblically. Number one, you have to accept. You have to accept the sacrifice of Christ. You have to believe that He's the way, the truth, and the life. And you have to believe that this is the way it is done. Number three, you must confess. You must confess. And there must be a decision. Revelation 3.20. We must have all four of these components. Romans 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone is, sin, has, is a sinner, therefore everyone must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be a new person, one that's back in harmony because you won't enter heaven otherwise. So you must be born again. All have sinned. Acts 16 verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. The faith covers the children. Wonderful. All have sinned, I must accept it, and I must believe in the merits of Christ, and I must confess my sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So if I have a baptism without a confession, is it valid? No. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9. And behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me, Revelation 3.20. This is what I love about the character of God. He doesn't force anyone. What does he do? He stands at the door and knocks. He doesn't force his way in. So what must you do in the final analysis? You must accept the invitation. You must open the door and invite him into your life. Now, 
we know what it stands for, does it also mean that I become part of Christ's church when I'm baptized? For by one spirit are we all baptized. Not ten spirits, not twenty, not a thousand, not two thousand, one spirit. We are all baptized into how many bodies? One body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. Now remember the word Jews was used for the early Christians as well. They were regarded still as Jews or Gentiles. Whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. There's only one. One truth. There aren't ten truths, thousands of truths. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. So the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 2 verse 47. So when you accept the rite of baptism, when you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, when you are baptized, you become part of the body of Christ. And that body of Christ must be the one that teaches how many things? All things. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into how many bodies? One body. And He is the head of the body, the church. Colossians 1.18. Yes. So baptism by immersion is personal, but it is also corporate. It means you become part of the body of Christ. Now what about rebaptism? If you have been baptized, let's say you've been baptized in a way that is not in accordance with the entire biblical principle, what then? Is rebaptism called for? Well, let's read what happened in Acts 19, 1 to 5. Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? So, they had accepted Christ. They were believers. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Now John preached the baptism of repentance. But the baptism in Christ implies becoming part of the body of Christ and receiving the gift empowering you to preach Christ. Then said Paul, John very, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him who should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 19, 1 to 5. Now, again, some denominations will say, well, that means we must only baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. But the Lord Jesus himself said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the messianic portion. Yes, you have to realize who the Messiah is, but when you are baptized, you are baptized into the fullness of the Godhead. You're not just baptized proportionally or portion, a portion of it. Without Christ, there is no salvation. But Christ and the Father are what? One. You can't be baptized into the one without being baptized into the other. It's impossible. So baptism by immersion, rebaptism is called for. If you feel that you've had a total biblical baptism, then as I've said, the Seventh-day Adventist Church acknowledges that, and you become part of the body that keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus by a profession of faith. But if you feel that it is better to be baptized into the full truth, then baptism, rebaptism, is not unbiblical. So God works through his church. This is very, very important. Acts 9 verse 6. He's one of the greatest disciples of Christ. And he, trembling and astonished, says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This is Paul himself. Paul on the road to Damascus has a vision 
and he sees Jesus Christ and he realizes he's in transgression. He's persecuting Christ by persecuting his followers. And he repents and he says, what wilt thou have me do? And the Lord says to him, you know, Paul, I've called you to be an apostle to the Gentiles, and I want you to go to all the parts of the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing like that happened. Not even to the mighty Paul. This is what happened. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Isn't that fascinating? God does not work outside his body. He leads people, he nurtures people, but in the final analysis he will lead them to the body. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, there was the disciple that God chose of the brethren to tell Paul what he had to do. And putting his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightst receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 9, verse 17. It's a very important text. God does not raise up people outside to go and tell the body what to do. He sends them to the body to be told what to do. Does that make sense? So these are very important biblical principles whereby one can find solidity in one's faith. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14 verse 12. So at the end of time, God would see to it that there would be a body that not only preaches baptism by immersion and salvation in Christ and Christ alone, but teaches all things, even the precepts of Christ. And as Christ set an example in all things, so they have to set an example of, in all things. If Christ said, I've set you an example in foot washing, then you must do it, then that denomination must do foot washing. If Christ said baptism by immersion, then that denomination must do baptism by immersion. If Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments, then that denomination must keep the commandments. Is that right or wrong? Every single thing must be in harmony with the word. And if it's not, then it's problematic. The three angels' messages. There's only one denomination in the world that preaches the three angels' messages. There is no other. You can search through this earth from north to south, east to west. There's only one denomination, one Christian denomination, that teaches the three angels' messages. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John 10, 16. God is going to bring the whole world to a decision. Very soon, this whole world will have to make a decision. Nowhere in all these lectures have I ever said that if you are not a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you are lost. In fact, I've said God's people are in all churches. But God is going to call everyone to reckoning. And he's going to say, choose, mark of the beast or the mark of God, one of the two. Be sealed with a seal from the world or be sealed with a seal of God. And we did a big study on what that entails. The seal of God, the Sabbath, is a symbol of obedience to the lawgiver in all aspects. And the sheep will have to listen, either one way or the other. Neither prayer for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So preaching the word is part of the gospel of salvation. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. 
that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. John 17, 20, 21. He says, I do not pray for the world. I pray for those that are willing here to obey. <coughs> now I know that we've been through a lot together. And as it was in the days of old, so will it be in our day. But I'm not discouraged. Do you know, we've seen numbers decline and decline and decline. And that's normal. When you preach the fullness of obedience in Christ and accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's not as, po as popular as preaching something which is less troublesome. And so one has this idea that this is a hard teaching. This is a hard teaching. Do I really have to change my life? Do I really have to die? Does the old man of sin really have to be buried? Can't I just keep a little of him? Can't I just be a little bit in transgression? Do I really have to come into harmony with all the precepts of the Decalogue? Can I not just continue keeping Sunday, for example? Is it not possible? This is a hard teaching, you know? It requires a lot. Yes, it does. It requires a lot. John 6, 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Nothing old, nothing new there. John 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. We've seen exactly the same thing happening here. Exactly the same thing. John 6 verse 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And what did they answer? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. If there is only one truth, and that truth is the, the way, and the truth, and the life, and it leads to Christ, and Christ leads us to obedience, then there is no other way. So when we are faced with a decision, am I going to do this, am I not going to do this? If I want to have life, and I know what's right, and I do it not, then it becomes for me what, says the Bible? Sin. So I have to make a decision. Some will say, there are many things I do not understand yet. There's too much that I don't understand. I cannot make a decision. I don't understand many things. How long would you be able to put it off this way? Probably forever. I don't understand everything. I certainly don't. And I presume that I will be learning for the rest of my existence, even throughout eternal life. Let's see what the Bible says on this issue. Psalms 97, 11. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. I believe that everybody sitting here today, we've been together through this whole series. We have done so much together and still you are sitting here so I know that you, you enjoyed this light. Maybe it wasn't easy, but you listen. Psalms 112 verse 4, Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. Start understanding how it all fits together. There are so many questions. Why this? Why that? Why is this one like that? Why is that one the other way? How can we all belong to the same thing? How is one saved? All these questions. If you really are upright in heart, God gives you the answer. Psalms 119, verse 130, the entrance of thy words gives light. So if it's not word-based, if it's not biblical, then that light is not necessarily from God. Proverbs 4, 18, the path of the righteous is like the first glimpse of dawn shining ever brighter till the full light of day. So, will it get brighter and brighter and brighter as one goes on? Yes or no? Yes, you can never get to the point where, where you can say, I st understand it all, otherwise you can put it away. You know, I've discovered one thing. I can take a novel, I can take a science book. I'm a, I'm a professor in physiology. There's a physiology book that I used 
for a long time. I don't even have to bother to pick it up anymore. I can go to my class and I can preach it off by heart. Just leave it there. I never have to look in it again. The book doesn't change. It's exactly the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. New stuff, yes, that you have to keep up to date with. But that book, I don't have to bother about it. But the Bible, I've been studying that now for 16 years. And I still am overawed by what I read in the verse that I thought I knew every single day. You will learn forever and ever. So this, this reason for not following Christ in fullness is one that you will never overcome except by taking a step of faith. None of the priests and the rulers believe. This is a very important question. If this is truth, how many lectures have we had together? I forget. Whatever it was. 30. I don't know. And every single one of them. Did it sound like the truth to you, yes or no? Can I see some hands? Who says it sounded like the truth? I can see a couple of hands. Now if this sounded like the truth, and if this is the truth, then where are all the big guns? Why are they not here? Where are all the others? Where are all the theologians and the priests and the pastors and the this and the that? Why aren't they all rushing to this if this is truth? Well, nothing's ever changed in the past. They also didn't do it. John 7.32, the chief priest sent officers to arrest him. They didn't even bother to go and listen to him himself. They just sent someone. Go and get rid of that guy. He is irritating. Do you know what's nice about the faith that I stand for? He said, I don't have to hide it. Amen. I can go into a public venue. I can book the biggest hall in the world. And I can stand there and I can preach it. And nobody will be able to say it's not so. Because I never said a word. I just put one quote after the other on the screen. Isn't that right? Isn't that what we did? So what would they do if they came and said, don't listen to him? What if Rome came to condemn me and said, how dare this man say these things? And they arrest me for saying these things. All I will say is I never said a word. They said it themselves. Go and arrest them. They said it. Go and arrest them. So this faith is not something that is grabbed out of the air. It's based on the biblical foundation and I can defend it anywhere. I don't have to go knocking like a thief on a back door and slip you a pamphlet to coerce you into this, that or the other. To enforce you to be here, you're all sitting here by your own free choice, listening and checking verse for verse, going back. I've got uh, a letter there of a, a person there who went back to the, to, the, to the web to see, is this really so? I love that. This dark day question, looked up that date, wow, there it says. Dark day, New England, to this day, unexplained. And they bring it to me and they say, yes, being confirmed. Every single word. Every single word. The chief priests, they sent officers to go and arrest him. Verse 46, they came back and they said to the priests, sorry. They said, where is he? We sent you to arrest him. And they said, but you know, no one ever spoke like this man. Nobody ever gave them so much to think about as Jesus did. Verse 47, you mean he has deceived you also? Has any of the rulers and the Pharisees believed him? Well, we're in much the same boat. Fortunately, even in biblical times, many of the Pharisees and the scribes did believe. Most of them didn't, but many of them did. Nicodemus did. Even though he came in the middle of the night, scared that he might be seen, he believed. And he was a powerhouse after that. I tell you that thousands and thousands are accepting this truth. Thousands. There are millions across the globe that are accepting this truth. And they're being added to every single day. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. In South America, every day, two, three thousand are being added. Every single day. Now you just add that up over time. Millions are coming into this truth. 
if they do surveys and they find out how many Seventh-day Adventists are there, then you will find that on the, on the surveys there are more Seventh-day Adventists than in the books of the church. That's fascinating. If a government does a survey in its country asking what denomination do you belong to, there are more Seventh-day Adventists in that country than on the books of the church. What does that tell you? That in their hearts they've accepted this truth, but they haven't made their final step yet. There are whole churches, including the pastor, whole churches that are coming over to this truth. Why? Because there's so much to it, you cannot gainsay it. And others will say, you mean he has deceived you also? None of the others have believed him. Well, maybe they haven't bothered to study it. Some will say the price is too high. I don't want to pay this price. I have to give up too much. What is there to give up? My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not my will, but as you will. It's, it's profound that God should choose something as simple as obedience, a day, to make a difference between right and wrong. Absolutely amazing. I'll wait till the Spirit moves me. You know, I really know this is right, but you know, I really don't want to move yet. Isn't that another one that people use? Well, Proverbs 16 verse 25 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. If you know something is right, then do it. I'm not one of those evangelists who will stand up here and pressurize you because all these times we have spoken to your minds and hopefully to your hearts as well. But I certainly would like to have your heart and your mind working together. This is your choice, not mine. I don't have to force you. You decide. Is this right or is this wrong? Maybe you really do believe that you don't know yet. You're not certain. That's fair enough. Then you say, but I either want to learn more about this because I think this is right, or I want nothing else to do with it. That's also your decision. No one else's. It will cause division. I know that if I accept this, my husband or my wife, they're going to freak. I might lose my boyfriend or my girlfriend, my job. My family is going to go nuts. Mine did. My cousin did this across the table. He says, that's your half, and this is my half. I'll never put my foot in your house again. We were best friends. We were always together. We ate together. We drank together. We laughed together. We cried together. He hasn't been in my house in 16 years. It's tough. My family, some of them actually know it's the truth, but won't move. It's amazing, amazing. And others, whole families just accept it. I cannot understand it. It drives me nuts. I'm so jealous. <laughs> whole family, father, mother, uncle, boyfriend, girlfriend. I gave Bible studies in my home to a group of people. And uh, the one girl was going out with, one of, with my son. My son brought her to the Bible study. So she started listening to the Bible study. Next thing she brought her sister. They were Methodists. Brought her sister. Next thing they brought the father. Next thing they brought the mother. Next thing they brought the other boyfriends and the other... Every single one. No problem. Unbelievable. Sometimes it works like that. You don't know. But it can certainly cause division. Matthew 10, 34, 37, Think not I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. The word is going to be the sword. And that's going to be the only weapon that we have. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Do you know what? 
The Bible has every base covered. There's no way to move out of this one, except decide. He that does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now that entails a cross. That means it's a burden. You have to pick it up and you have to follow Christ. That doesn't mean we are wretched, miserable individuals. But it does take a cross. It is a burden. And you know what the greatest burden is? Your greatest burden does not become yourself anymore. Your greatest burden is... How many of you felt this? Huh? How am I going to convince my mother, father, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend? How many of you felt this? Can I see some hands? I can see some hands. This is the burden. The burden is just like Christ had a burden for souls. My wife sat down and cried when she heard these messages for the first time. Not for herself, but for her parents. Her father. She loved her father. He was such a nice man. He's dead now. So kind. So generous. He was such fun to have around. And he was a new ager probably a high mason, an occultist, and he worshipped the devil. Wow, that's pretty scary. I don't know what happened to him in the end. We took care of him until he died, or my wife did. And uh, he never ever said one negative word towards the end anymore. And what went on in his mind is between God and him. I wish, I hope, I believe I will see him at the resurrection. But everyone has a cross and we have to follow him. But now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Isaiah 43 verse 1. Do you think God will leave you alone with that cross? No. To carry it alone? No. no. There it says, I've created you, and I've formed you, and there's nothing to be afraid of. He is the one who says, fear not. <coughs> Those are the issues. That's what we've discussed all this time. Oh, there's much more. We haven't even started yet. Have we had a Daniel seminar? No, we've touched here and there on Daniel. Have we had a Revelation seminar? No, we've touched here and there on Revelation. Why do I talk about those two books? Because they particularly concern our time, the end of time. We haven't touched Isaiah, which is the whole Bible, in one prophetic word. My favorite book, Isaiah. Wow, such comfort in that book. We haven't read the Psalms together to discern what all the Psalms, some of them are eschatological, some are messianic, some are just comfort, some are what it means to be repenting. We haven't read the Torah together, we've done nothing. We've been through the precepts and the principles, there's so much more to learn. And we're going to continue with this, even though I'm going to leave and I'm going to be gone, it's not me that you're interested in, you're interested in Jesus Christ, he's all that matters. And when you come into a body, that's who you serve. You serve Jesus Christ. You don't look around and say, now, why is this one like that? Why is this one not doing what is right? It's not your business whether he's doing right or whether he's not doing right. Your business is to follow Christ and to follow his precepts. And we must come into harmony. That means I can go to my brother and say, listen, brother, why are you still doing this when the Bible actually says this and that and the other in love? You can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't expect perfection, but expect truth. And don't give up until you find all of it. That's what it's all about. And follow Christ. And he, uh, he will help you. Fear not. He who has redeemed you. So that is the issue. Not that we've finished, but we've come to a point where we can make a decision. So I would like to invite anyone who has decided or has come to the conclusion that this is truth to stay behind afterwards so that we can discuss how do we continue? Where do we go from here? 
How do I fulfill the rite of baptism? Or I have been baptized already, or I'm not ready yet. What do I do? Where do I get nurtured further? What do I do? Can't just run away from the body of Christ. They were at it daily. So I would like to invite everyone that was convicted that we've heard truth up until now to stay behind when we end now. And let's talk briefly, just briefly together as to what are we going to do on the way forward. Some of you might feel you're ready for baptism. Some might feel I want to join the body. Some might feel otherwise. Let's do that after this meeting. No pressure, nothing like that. Just your decision. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord for truth. Thank you for a word that is truth from the first page to the last. And thank you for the example that you have set us in Jesus Christ. Help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you and to follow you in all obedience. Lord, please come into our hearts and into our minds and help us to make right decisions so that we will follow you wheresoever you lead and not where man intends to lead any one of us. Thank you for all the people that are here tonight. And thank you, Lord, that you are speaking to every single one of us. Lord, there are many that have known this truth for years, myself included. And I would also tonight, together with them, like to recommit my life to you. Amen. And say, Lord, I might have slipped along the pathway. I might have made mistakes. But I know, Lord, that by your grace the righteous man falls many times, but you raise him up again. So those who want to recommit their lives to you, may they also make a decision tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.